Coming up on this week's show, we have a Barbara Walters moment with Rick R. Reed. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knauss. Welcome to episode number 85 of Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com. And I'm Will from willknauss.com. This week's episode is sponsored in part by listeners just like you. We'll have more information on how you can help support this show in just a few minutes. Welcome back from the land of the, uh, tubercular. <laughs> really? Yeah. We, we we kept our coughs through the week. I'm actually more, I don't feel bad today, but I'm certainly coughing more than I have all week long. We were sick during last week's show, and due to Jeff's masterful editing, um, I didn't cough in your ear. Um, we maintained our illness throughout most of the week, and we're finally on the upswing. I think so. Yeah. It'll be my job to cut my own coughs out today. I think so. Show up. I think so. Okay, so, so, now that we're feeling slightly better, uh, how was your week? It was okay. I mean, we were, we were tubercular. Um, yeah. I lost all of yesterday, basically, to being ill. I think I only got done the absolute must-do's. Of yesterday, like oh, grocery shopping and uh, <laughs> getting some prizes out to some to some lovely listeners and uh, auction winners and whatnot, and then I kind of went, okay, I'm done. Uh, it was bad enough that we did not go to the theater yesterday. We were supposed to go down south and well, a little bit south, not like San Francisco south, but to see Beauty and the Beast at a local uh, repertory company, and we just pushed those tickets off to next week because I needed a break, I needed to rest, so. I think that's why I feel better today, is you made told me I could rest, and I did. Yeah. yeah. You and see, you should always listen to me. That's usually true. Mm -hmm. uh, got some uh, more revisions done. Same old, same old with that. Uh, about ten days to go until I have to turn that story in, so I won't be talking about revisions for much longer. <laughs> at least, At least not with that story. <laughs> awesome. Uh, got some big news coming up this week. Big news! Big news! <laughs> Ooh, well done. Thank you. <laughs> I like that. Can you keep that going while I do this? No, that's, yeah, no. One Darn. Time, no, one time thing. Okay. So if you remember back in November, we uh, co-sponsored the Big Gay Fiction Giveaway uh, with author Michael Jensen. That giveaway is back for one week only, starting today, Monday, May 22nd, and running through Monday, May 29th, Memorial Day. More than 80 authors have banded together to give you free books which are novels, novellas, uh, short stories, samplers, a whole bunch of goodness going on there. These uh, books, blah, 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 these books <laughs> will be available to you by going to biggayfictionpodcast.com slash giveaway. You'll see all 80 books on the screen, and you click on those, you'll hop over to Instant Freebie to fill out a little bit of information, and then you get to you know get your book in the email, and uh, it's pretty awesome. I've seen the lineup of books, of course, because I helped build that page. A lot of good stuff going on there, mm -hmm. so make sure to check out BigGayFictionPodcast.com slash giveaway between May 22nd and May 29th. Yeah. The giveaway last year was really good. There were a lot of uh, great authors and really interesting titles, uh, and I have also had a sneaky peek yes, at the page you've been building, and there are uh, even more awesome authors and uh, terrific books, so definitely check that out. Yeah, it'll be a good way to prep everybody's summer TBR. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, stock up on some of those good reads. It's going to be uh, a lot of fun. Yeah. Good stuff. Do you want to give our congrats? Congrats to Heather. You won the RT tote bag that we were talking about. Woohoo! <laughs> Not too long ago. Uh, that bag was filled with books and swag. And Heather, your package is on the way. Yes, you were one of the few things I did yesterday <laughs> was to get that, paid, that package into the, into the mail for you. So you should have it soon. 
Um, now is the portion of the show where we talk about sponsorship. Indeed. Um, you can help support the Big Gay Fiction Podcast with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For as little as 25 cents an episode, your pledge helps pay for the cost of producing and distributing this podcast. And for those fans who pledge at the silver and gold levels, you'll have the exclusive opportunity to ask questions of some of our upcoming guests. Now, you can get details on becoming a patron at patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast.com that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash biggayfictionpodcast so be sure and check it out there's lots of great stuff there um not only can you help support this show we also have a couple of bonus episodes now uh in the four per- four four bonus episodes in the proverbial bank uh so once you become a patron you have access to those past bonus episodes as well as any upcoming bonus episodes that we record in the future yes uh so yeah i think it's a great thing too to get to ask questions of our guests we've got our guest list upcoming guest list posted there with some pretty fabulous guests on the docket coming up in the next couple months (laughs) fabulous if we do say so ourselves (laughs) yes well (laughs) would we book anything less than a fabulous guest no absolutely not. not Hell no. <laughs> uh, and, uh, in truth, there are some pretty amazing people coming up. Uh, even I'm surprised. It's like, what? <laughs> That's exactly. awesome. See? Yeah, some good stuff coming up. Whether you prefer to spend your summer vacation poolside, at the beach, or in the air-conditioned comfort of home, we've got the books that'll keep you turning pages all summer long. And now to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast Sweet Summer Fun Paperback Giveaway. We're giving you the chance to win four terrific books by two amazing authors. The prize pack includes paperback copies of Aiden's Journey and Sex, Love, and Video Games by C. Jane Elliott, as well as Dumb Jock and Trust Me by Jeff Erno. To enter, go to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com or visit the official giveaway page at BigGayFictionPodcast.com slash summer. If you can't get enough of stories filled with young love, self-discovery, and happily ever afters, then you're not going to want to miss out on this. Go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com slash summer before the rafflecopter ends on Sunday, June 11th. So this is the portion of the show where you talk about a whole bunch of books. I don't know if it's a whole bunch, but it is two. Awesome. Uh, The first one uh, is The Senator's Secret uh, by Casey Wells. Now, you reviewed this one back in uh, episode 57. Well, yes, I did. And I, as I recall, you loved it to pieces. Loved it to pieces. And I decided to read this because during RT, Casey and I hung out like every morning having coffee. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I need to read a, a Casey book because it'd been a while. Yeah. And so I plucked this one off of our uh, bookshelf, our actual bookshelf, since we get the paperbacks for Dream Spun. And I loved it. I loved it. Oh, my goodness. Um, to me, this book almost defines everything a dreams fun desire should be. Mm-hmm. It's light, it's fun, the angst is low, um, and so I loved it. So this is, uh, you, you meet uh, Senator, Senator Sam Dalton. Let me just read the back of the book better. Uh, <laughs> Senator Sam Dalton, uh, who is up for re-election, and uh, one day he is out on a smoke break and gets to talking to one of his staffers uh, named Gary. And we find out that Gary is on his way to grad school for veterinary medicine. And they share just a celebratory hug. It's a brief celebratory hug of good job uh, that somebody manages to photograph. And it becomes, you know, fodder for his Republican uh, opponent to go, oh, my God, what does this mean? Is that a relationship? Oh, no. And uh, they very quickly spin it into a marriage of convenience, announcing that they're actually engaged and have been choosing to... You know, not detract from the campaign by announcing it. And as these things go, as they get to know one another better, uh, what initially starts off as just a plot to keep the campaign running actually turns into love between the senator and his and his campaign worker. And these two are adorable. From the very first time they go to wash dogs at the, at the kennel where Gary is a uh, volunteer, it is off and running and they are totally adorable. And what angst there is, is their opponent who continues to try to disprove their relationship and everything. And of course, they are, they find the best ways to push back against that. 
and and to you know just make themselves stronger and ultimately make their love stronger and the campaign stronger. Um, I loved these two characters. I loved the interaction between Sam and his mother. As mm-hmm. as poor mom finds out her boy's gay during a news conference and that he's engaged, like what the hell's happening here? Uh, but she is really one of their staunchest supporters in the long run, and I really loved her and her trip to the drugstore. So you can read all about that in the book. Uh, but yeah, Casey Wells, The Senator's Secret, I loved it. And of course, you know, Will's recommendations are always good anyway. So the other book I have read, uh, which is a little bit outside the genre for this uh, podcast, but uh, back at episode 74, I reviewed the first book in Igor Max's Mind Agent series. Mm -hmm. It's a young adult series about these kids who have special powers, a little bit like X-Men kind of mental powers. One can remove thoughts from someone's mind, one can fly, one can move inanimate objects, one can hide people, it's... It was a pretty nifty start to a series. I've just finished Deceived, which is book two in the series, and I continue to just love this to pieces. Um, this time the guy, the, the team has to stop another plot inside the government uh, with a senator who has gone all crazy gathering up some other mind agents like these uh, original four kids are, as well as making himself into somewhat of a god. He, he reminds me a little bit of Magneto. Mm. And how he feels that he just okay. he, that he knows the right way to do everything, mm. uh, and in the long run, to the, to me, this one is a little bit X Men, a little bit Indiana Jones for reasons that you'll you'll have to see where the Indiana Jones comes in by reading the book itself. Ooh. So yeah, I won't go on too much about this one uh, because it really falls outside the gay fiction genre for us. But if you want to read a snazzy YA thriller, give Deceive to try. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So, Brett, bridging from books into TV. Okay. The fall TV season is wrapping up. Many shows have finaled, and a few more will wrap up in this coming week. Plus, before we get into all that, there's some groovy stuff that's been happening on Kickstarter mm-hmm. this particular week. Uh, Eastsiders, which, as you know, is one of our favorite things to watch, uh, announced that they were well underway of shooting season three, and they had a Kickstarter kickoff. How's that Kickstarter kickoff <coughs> this week? Uh, and they are already halfway to their 60K uh, goal, yes. which is awesome. Uh, if you have not watched East Siders, you really should check out this show, which is about a, a gang of friends who live in, is in Silver Lake. Yeah, in Silver Lake. And it's it's just their lives and their loves, and it's, it's really such a good show. Uh, we've talked about it a couple of times. You can stream it on Netflix. We are eagerly awaiting their season three, and you can back their Kickstarter if you choose, which is running through June 6th, and they've got some nifty uh, uh, goals that you can uh, take part in as well. And we'll put the Kickstarter link in the show notes, because Kickstarter links do not read out well over the air. (laughs) Um, The other thing that surfaced this week was in a heartbeat, and this is one that you slid in front of me. Yes, um, In a Heartbeat is something I stumbled across on the internet as one is wont to do. Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, there is a super cute mini trailer for this short film called In a Heartbeat. Um, it's a grad project from uh, Beth and Esteban, students at the Ringling College of Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida. Um, and the the like mini trailer that they have assembled... Uh, was making the rounds, and that's why I saw it in like my news feed. And it's just the most adorable, cutest little thing ever. It's about a grade school boy whose heart betrays him and literally jumps out of his chest at like the the cutest, most popular boy in his class. Uh, and his little heart um, runs around chasing after this cute boy, and hilarity and shenanigans ensue. Um, so they had a Kickstarter, was it last year, the end of last year, um, and mm-hmm. they have completely funded this short film. So right now they're in the process of completing it. Um, if you would like to know more about this little project or to see the uh, insanely adorable little <laughs> little trailer, you can go to Kickstarter, search in a heartbeat, or uh, I actually liked their Facebook page. Oh, nice. Uh, they have their own page there. And they have uh, the trailer and some artwork. 
Um, There's he, some totally adorable artwork. Yeah. Um, somebody's done a poster that uh, takes a riff off of the Fault in Our Stars poster from several years ago, which was adorable, um, and some other YA-type mm-hmm. art there, too. So we'll put the link to Kickstarter, their Facebook page, in the show notes, so you can check that out. Uh, I don't think I think the Kickstarter is completely done, and so you can't really join any more of that, but it's it'll be worth keeping an eye on what happens within a heartbeat yeah. as it starts to hopefully roll out. Looking forward to that. Yeah. So moving on from Kickstarter and future things, let's talk about things that are drifting into the past here pretty quickly, which is the fall TV season. (laughs) You're good with the sound effects today. (laughs) I'm on fire. So the the supers on the CW are really close to wrapping up. Uh, I think of the four, and Legends, of course, actually wrapped up back in March. Mm -hmm. Uh, Of the four, I feel like Supergirl and The Flash have had pretty decent seasons. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, really like what the, what Supergirl's done on uh, the CW, and it was particularly fun this past week to watch essentially Wonder Woman and Lois Lane go at it, with uh, Linda Carter and Terry Hatcher both having guest appearances in last week's penultimate episode of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious to see, without giving spoilers on Flash, although it's really hard to have missed if you're watching the show what's going on there this week, I'm curious to see how Flash is going to wrap the season with where they've left things. Uh, with Savitar. Uh, I'll be glad when Arrow's over for the season. Uh, you actually stepped out of Arrow for quite a few shows. I watched f- three episodes in about 45 minutes recently because some of it, it's just like, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. Speed, 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 speed. Um, and Legends, I thought, had a good second season. I was I was pleased with the fun, kind of lighthearted way the show treated itself, even while it was dealing with its big bads mm-hmm. that it had to deal with. What are your what are your brief thoughts on the Supers? Uh, briefly, I agree. I enjoyed how Legends came back for its second season far better than the first season, uh, which I essentially kind of hated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think it came back much stronger uh, with a much more clearly defined identity about what it was and what it was about. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the Supergirl Season 2, what with its network shift and everything that went on. I think they've uh, pretty much done a pretty good job considering everything that they had to deal with. Not everything was perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, I th- Calissa Flockhart, come back more often. I know. I, I know I, Vancouver's not your thing, but please come <laughs> back more often. Um, there's some... Uh, they had... Mm, some of the stuff was mediocre. I think the stuff that they did with Jimmy and his whole... Uh, oh. I, I feel left out. I'm not a hero. <laughs> it's just... Ugh. Stupid and boring and, you know... Yeah. Everything else was actually pretty darn good. Uh, so I'm very happy with Supergirl. Um, uh, same goes for Flash. I think overall it has been very enjoyable, pretty darn good. Not perfect by any means, but um, I think this year's big stupid bad. Uh, last year we had Zoom and that was all pretty dumb. Uh, <laughs> they tried to fix their big bad this season and did marginally better. The whole Savitar thing is still pretty dumb, but I think this year's story uh, is far more grounded in people we care about, i.e. Iris getting killed. Um, So I think, um, while not perfect, it's certainly a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. Uh, Arrow is a garbage fire. Um, (laughs) um, Steve Mel himself admitted that last year was... Uh, screw up, uh, and they were going to make season five better. They did not. I hate this show. I literally hate it. Yeah. Um, it's gone so far off the rails. Um, so much stupidity and crap and junk and um, there are a few a teeny tiny bright spots, but overall, I think this season has been pretty unbearable. Uh, I stopped watching it. Because I literally said to you, I hate this show. Yep. <laughs> uh, I skipped I skipped three episodes, and uh, I did not miss a thing. 
Nope. Last last night we sat down and watched the current episode, which I believe is the penultimate. It is. The penultimate episode for season five, and I did not miss a thing with those three episodes. Uh, it still is what it is. Yeah. And there were some bright spots last night, I felt. Yeah. Um, but I think it's safe to say if... if I mean, we're giving it the finale, and we'll come back first of next season. But if if there's not a distinct turn, I think we might be done with Arrow, except for crossover episodes. Yeah. Um, one quick thing back on Legends that I'll throw out because I didn't put this in the fall wrap up notes. Mm-hmm. Um, Whitworth Miller and Dominic Purcell are both on Legends as Captain Cold, and mm, I don't know what his is. He's not Captain Heat, but I don't know what no. Rory uh, and they call him something. They call him something. Some but fires. Some I don't, thing. I don't know. Uh, they're <laughs> they're outlandishly delightful in Legends, and it's been kind of a treat to watch uh, Prison Break back with Wentworth and Dominic back in the roles that they founded maybe what ten years ago now. Yeah, no, yeah, at least. Um, the Prison Break reboot has been fun television. It's not great, but it's it's fun and it's. It's been really cool to watch these characters, especially Wentworth this past week when he was on The Flash one night and then on Prison Break the next as wildly different characters. That's been a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, we've li- we've both enjoyed uh, Speechless this year. Yes, we and have. And if you're not watching Speechless, you really should pick that up. It is a smart, excellent family comedy with uh, a, a teenager at its center who has uh, cerebral palsy. It's such a smart, heartfelt comedy. I love it. I love Beamy Driver. Um, I would be careful with the word heartfelt. Because it's not, it's not smarmy inspiration bait. No, that it is not. <laughs> it's, it's actual family. It's a family doing everything it can in some, in some, in some difficult circumstances. And they love each other. Uh-huh. Uh, I... It, just in um it's heartfelt in the best way possible heart heartfelt in the best way it's i think it's just wickedly funny the cast is uh superb Mm -hmm. um they uh, every single one of them uh hits it out of the park every week they're so so funny yeah the young Um, man who plays jj (laughs) the looks he'll give with his face when people are being stupid around (laughs) are just priceless Mm -hmm. (laughs) mm-hmm Uh, Big Bang Theory, I thought it had a pretty solid season 10. Mm-hmm. And I love, spoiler if you haven't seen it, but it's over a week now. So it's on you if you haven't seen the Big Bang finale. Uh, I love that there was a proposal between Amy and Sheldon. And uh, it's fascinating to see how this show has married off now, you know, half of its primary cast. Uh, and it'll be three-fourths by the time we get to, you know, if the proposal actually goes through. Which is something, of course, friends never did. They there was one couple that was married there towards the end with uh, Monica and and Chandler. But so this is interesting groundbreaking, interesting sitcom thing where you get everybody paired off eventually. Um, Superstore, we love our Superstore, and that finale with the tornado was cuckoo bananas. Yes, it was. <laughs> um, it's going to be um, interesting. They could take this in. Uh, whatever direction they want next year, um, yeah. Uh, I, I'm I'm not a hunt. Well, I don't know. It, I mean, they could have just said let's let's blow the whole thing up and we can start fresh next year. Or maybe they were sort of like I don't know if we're gonna get renewed. Let's blow the whole thing up, kind of deal. Um, do you do you know any behind the scenes? I don't know info? the behind the scenes. I mean, you were left with a whole literally blown through the store because the tornado did significant damage to the store in the finale. And I don't know if that was shot before or after they had a pickup or Mm -hmm. not, but it's going to be interesting to see where they come back. Yeah, that'll be fun. Uh, We've enjoyed The Voice, although we've we've had no frontrunner this year, which is why we haven't really talked about it a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. But the the finale uh, is over the next two days, uh, this Monday and Tuesday, and I'm looking forward to seeing who wins. I'm hoping for either Jesse, which will make my app team complete and whole for the entire season, <laughs> or honestly, Chris Blue, because mm-hmm. uh, he. I wish I'd put him on my team early on. Yeah. Um, we, uh, yeah, I wasn't super. Mm, I wasn't super engaged at the beginning of the season, uh, and I don't know if that was just my personal thing. 
that I was working through. <laughs> um, it's not. Me- <laughs> I I don't know. I I I don't know. I it could be. I'm just like a little used to the format now. I kind of get it. It's the same every time. And I was just sort of like you know towards the beginning of the season. You know the blinds and the battle. So I was like, okay, well, eh, okay, whatever. Um, because there hasn't really been a super big standout this this particular season. Yeah. Usually there's someone towards the beginning, they like knock it out of the park right away, and you kind of follow them throughout, you know, all the intervening rounds, and uh, they make it to the finale because they're the, they're the, you know, you know, in bold quotes, front runner. Um, I don't think this season has really had one of those. Mm-hmm. So, which isn't to, to mean that I haven't enjoyed this season. I actually have. Uh, and the season has been filled with uh, absurdly talented people. Uh, and I'm generally happy with the final four going into the finale. It wasn't who I expected, but um, uh, yeah, there all were, four there were a couple them, surprises there. All four of them are really terrific. Uh, and we'll see who gets chosen as the one. Da, da, da. Da, da, da. Um, also, something we gave a little try to uh, a couple weeks ago is E Entertainment had their. F- I'm not sure if it's their first. It might have been their first scripted. Their very first scripted show called The Arrangement. Um, it's a Hollywood drama about this superstar and the girl who gets cast as his real-life girlfriend, uh, and there are all sorts of uh, dark secrets and shenanigans involving the Institute of the Higher Mind, i.e. Scientology. Um, it's a, been a really... Uh, I really, really enjoyed it a lot. Um, far more than I would have imagined a scripted show on E! Entertainment. Um, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the leads were good. I think the script was uh, solid throughout. Uh, All the storylines were really, really interesting. And the finale left it in a really interesting place. Mm -hmm. Uh, So season two, which I believe is going to uh, happen next year in 2018, uh, should be very interesting. Looking forward to that. Yeah, I I almost walked away from this show twice. Because I'm like, this is just... I was like, this is just, this is too real life, this is stupid, and yet it's a train wreck that I can't stop watching <laughs> at the same time. And you're right, the acting is really good. I like Josh Henderson. Yes. Uh, who I think we first saw on Dallas, the Dallas reboot that happened a few years ago. I don't know who the girl is playing his girlfriend, but she's also really good. And the penultimate episode really kind of spun things in a direction I had not seen coming at all. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I will be back whenever it's uh, next season happens. So this past week you had the chance to sit down, well not like technically sit down because you were standing, but <laughs> you, you get to you got to stand and interview. Rick, Rick was sitting. Does Rick, that count? Rick, Rick was was sitting. Um, <laughs> you got to talk to Rick Reed. I did. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, we have not. We see Rick all the time at GRL and the DSP workshops, and we chat a little bit there. But this is really the first time where I've gotten to have some time to really get to know his writer's journey and more about the books that he writes mm-hmm. and the, the, the array of genres that he goes from like horror to more category romance with dreams, fun desires. Yeah. And, uh, we actually ended up and had a little Barbara Walters moment in the midst of this interview too, <laughs> which I don't think either of us expected to have. So yeah, it's a really good interview. Yeah, let's get to that right now. I'm excited to welcome Rick R. Reed to the podcast today. Rick is all about exploring the romantic entanglements of gay men in contemporary, realistic settings. While his stories often contain elements of suspense, mystery, and the paranormal, his focus ultimately returns to the power of love. He's a three-time epic ebook award winner and the winner of the Rainbow Award for Best Contemporary General Fiction. Lambda Literary Review has called him a writer that does not disappoint. Rick lives in Seattle with his husband and a very spoiled Boston Terrier. Welcome, Rick. Thanks, Jeff. I'm happy to be here. In my debut appearance. And we're Correct. very happy to have you here. Well, I'm happy to be here on this early morning. Yes, we're recording bright and early at 7.30. We're both in this Pacific time zone, so it's early for both of us. So you've had a very busy 2017 so far. You've had at least three books coming out that I could find. And back earlier this month of May, you had Pearls of Intimacy debut. Tell us what that one's about. Perils of Intimacy. Perils. 
Oh, that would be an interesting title too, Pearls of Intimacy. That that has some potential for erotica. Anyway, uh, Pearls of Intimacy is kind of a second chance contemporary romance about uh, kind of a dark subject. It's it, one of the characters is a former crystal meth addict who's cleaned up his life. He has a very simple life now, working as a waiter. He has a good relationship with two sponsors, and he's completely changed for the better. Um, and the impetus for the story and the romance is someone he tricked with two years ago when he was deep in the throes of his bad behavior, um, walks into the diner where he works and they begin to flirt with each other. The other guy who's an older guy doesn't recognize him because he's cleaned himself up. He looks completely different. And, um, so they begin to see each other and fall in love. But one knows the dark secret because the meth addict that night, not only, um, was it really a bad experience because of the drug, but also the guy robbed him blind. And so he, he's like waiting for the other shoe to drop and it's how they work through, you know, is, is there the possibility for a second chance when the truth comes out? And so that's kind of what the story revolves around. Mm -hmm. Where did the inspiration come from, from that? Because that's, that's certainly some very, you know, deep subject matter going into working with crystal meth addicts. Well, if crystal meth addiction is a big problem in the gay community mm -hmm. and a lot of thing and a lot of my books I like to deal with real issues in in gay life and I I know that this is something that I've seen friends affected by it. I, you know, it's 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 a serious problem, and and especially in our community. So I kind of wanted to write a romance about that, and show how there's a chance for redemption in life and in love, and that was my story and sort of my inspiration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that it's so tied to issues inside the community as well, because we don't always get that. In, in gay romance, second like chances are usually are can be you know on a much lighter level, right? Yeah. Now in April, you kind of went for a different angle and, and released a collection of gay horror stories titled Unhinged, right? Which is six stories all bound up together. Yeah, that's my um my other side. <laughs> dark Rick, dark and Rick light and. Uh, I guess the, even the romance has dark shadows in it, um, but but the really dark side of me is my horror side, which is actually where I began my writing career. I, I started as a horror novelist back in the early 90s and was published by Dell in, in mass market paperback. And um, so I still have a love for horror, but I think I've come to love romance more and I write more romance. But... But there's still always going to be a horror presence. And Unhinged is a good example of like the range of my horror work with an emphasis on gay characters and gay situations. And it goes from comic to deeply dark and horrific. There's, um, there's a story about Jeffrey Dahmer. There's a story about um, a stalker. There's a story about... Uh, let's see what else. There's a ghost, a really good ghost story. There's a story about a, a vampire who meets up with his prey on, in an online chat room. And so it's just, a, if, if you haven't read any of my horror, it's a good overview of kind of what I do with horror. And there's always an element of romance sprinkled in, even in any, even in a story like Meat Mallet, which is about a cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> who finds his victims in a cruising park on the north side of Chicago. I like that you find romance in, uh, manage to sprinkle it throughout. Do your, do your more typical romance audiences cross over to your horror and vice versa? Or do you find yourself writing in two, to two different audiences? I think there are, there are some crossovers. I think, um, 
I think people that read horror might be a little more open to reading romance. I know there are lots of people, the people who read my romance that are very, uh, no, I won't go there. I don't <laughs> anything scary and, and, and they don't. So, so it, I think it's, I think they're pretty distinct, different audiences. So, I mean, it's hard to know exactly, sure. but I know I've had, had romance readers say explicit to me, no, I don't want to read anything scary. Mm-hmm. Which makes sense. Yeah, I would. I might be able to do the the comedic horror, but horror is not often the 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 way I go down in movies or reading. Or although I did have a stint for a long time that I'd read Stephen King, and some of that's pretty horrific sometimes. <laughs> I've been reading Stephen King since I was a kid. I probably read everything he's written. <laughs> he's a big influence. So back to your work. Uh, Orientation also came out this spring, and that one seems quite different from the other two that we've already talked about with a, what almost sounds like a little bit of reincarnation from the blur. Cause I don't want to give away too many spoilers. Where did that idea come from? Cause that was really interesting to me. Orientation is probably one of my oddest books. It, I think it straddles a line between romance and horror. It, um, I mean, not even so much horror. I, I really think it's kind of gay literary fiction about that ex- uses reincarnation as a lens to explore what real love is. Because what the story is, is about a, a middle-aged gay man who lost his lover to AIDS back in the time when it was, it was really an epidemic and it was really a plague. And it's 20 some years later and he meets this young lesbian who's about to kill herself and he saves her. And she is actually the reincarnation of his former lover. And so they're having all these feelings. She's having all these strange dreams and of, of memories that she couldn't possibly have. And it's, it's just taking a look at how love goes beyond sexuality and maybe even gender. So that's sort of what I wanted to explore in that book. Mm-hmm. How, with all these different styles, I mean, you're kind of all over the place in the spectrum of contemporary. And then you also do what we would consider, you know, very category romance, like the Dream Spun Desire you did with uh, Vivian Dean called Stranded with Desire. Which was very fun. But it, it isn't the typical thing I do. Right. I'm all over the place, although there's a common theme, I think, to my stuff. Well, that's what I wanted to ask. What is your common theme that ties all this together? You know, before, when I was looking at the questions you sent me in advance, I thought, oh, I'm going to answer that with an R word, which would be reality, which I like to bring in an aspect of reality, even in the most fantastic stories. And that's true. I mean, even like um, Dinner at the Blue Moon Cafe, which is a werewolf story, still brings in issues of homophobia. And, and I kind of do like to bring in reality. But what, I, what just occurred to me, I think what all my stories have in common is how love has a redemptive power in our lives and can change everything. And it's probably the most important thing in, in, our, in our spirituality, in our, in our whole being. Mm-hmm. So I would change the answer I originally thought of from reality to redemption. And I think there's love's redemptive power is probably the theme that ties everything that I write together. Mm-hmm. And you still had an R word there too. So, yes. <laughs> but I think the reality is good too. I, uh, Cause all of that does seem to wind its way through and, but the redemptive quality I like a lot because that changes everything to the characters when they find that, you know, that redemptive moment. Yeah. Given all these ideas that you have, how do you decide what to write next? Is it just what, what appeals to you in the moment? Or are you looking at the market and deciding what you want to put into the, what the marketplace needs or? Well, dream spinner is, uh, for me, a great home publishing home. And, um, for the past several years, I've just been kind of 
tossing out my ideas with Elizabeth North, who's the head of Dream Spinner. And we've been just scheduling uh, my ideas. I, I think I have stuff scheduled now through 2019. Um, and I and I have way more ideas than I think I'll ever have time to write. So I you know, keep a file of potential ideas. But then I also have, you know, uh, sort of as best I can do a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet of the titles that are coming up through 2019. Did that answer your question? It did. It, it's pretty incredible uh, to be scheduled that far out. And, and great that, you know, you have that kind of guidepost on what you're going to write. Where do you think your ideas come from? Oh, that's, that's the $64,000 question. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I, I used to give smart ass answers, but, um, I mean, honestly, it's hard to say where inspiration comes from. It comes from all over the place. It can come, I think more and more as I get older, I will say that a lot of my ideas come from my own life and that may not be immediately apparent from the themes, but I know where they came from because, uh, you know, something that I write about could be a metaphor for something else that the reader wouldn't know, but I know. And, and, and then some things directly do come from my life, like, uh, my novel blink, which was another kind of second chance romance about, uh, that takes place in the 1980s and then the present day and how two people come together over the passage of all those years and all those changes. Um, and the first part of that in the 1980s is totally autobiographical. And my novel Caregiver is partly autobiographical. So I would say a lot of my ideas do come from my own heart. Mm -hmm. Now, you're, you're kind of prolific, as we talked about earlier. What's your balance between writing, editing, and marketing and everything that goes into the author career? Well, it's it's about priority. Um, I, th I think the number one thing I can do for my readers is write a good story. So my days are start off with writing. That's, that's the priority. That's where I want to give my best energy and my best time to. So, and, and I, I write, I give myself a, a goal of a, at least a thousand words a day. I usually surpass that. If I don't, it's okay, but it's a pretty easy goal to meet. So um, and it, it's not too much. I don't, I, I see writers posting on Facebook saying, Oh, I wrote 6,000 words today. And it's like, but were they good words? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to like burn myself out. So I, you know, I work on that early in the morning. Sometimes it's still even dark outside. And, and then I move on to like, if I have something in for editing, um, and then the promotion, that's that's takes up almost as much time as the writing, but you have to like say, I'm going to do two hours of social media and maybe creating some some ads in Canva, writing some blog posts. But if you don't, if I don't limit it, I could probably work for ten hours and twelve hours a day on promo stuff. Um, so I try to I try to with the promotion. I, th I think writers all tend to be a little introverted for the most part. And I, I think it's kind of a, we have to force ourselves out there. And I, that's certainly true for me. And so I try to do things where it's fun and where I'm not just writing, Oh, buy my book, but you know, here's who I am. Mm -hmm. And my writing is part of that. And hopefully by knowing me, you'll want to know, a little bit about what I do in my imagination. Okay. You mentioned you had a career when you were just doing horror books and you had, you know, you were putting out with Dell. What, <clears throat> what had you turned the corner into gay romance? And was it kind of a, a slow drift as the, as the romance was in your horror or was it more of a, of a distinct turn towards that genre? The truth is, I think, I've looked at this because it's a good question and it's a good question I've asked myself. And it's, I think when I was writing horror, I was at a different, you know, 
purely writing horror. I was at a different point in my life. Uh, you might say my life was more horrific. I wasn't finding the things I wanted. I was dissatisfied. I was depressed. I was unhappy. I have a string of, I won't go into describing them all, but I have a string of broken, failed relationships behind me. And I, I kind of got into a point where I think what made me want to write more romance was the advent of meeting my husband 15 years ago. Because I, when I met him, I had pretty much given up. I, I had just ended my last live-in relationship that was I, a disaster. And I just was really looking forward to just being single, and that's what I was going to be. And Bruce came along and... I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I get emotional. <laughs> uh, Bruce came along and screwed all that up. I didn't even get a chance to be single for more than a couple months. And, but he came along and he was, he was right. He was the first person in my life that was right. And that, that made me want to tell love stories more than horror. And I, I think that's, that was why I shifted from writing horror to romance mainly. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to give you a Barbara Walters moment this morning. <laughs> Does he read your work? Well, you know, I, I, my process is I don't like to share my work with, with people when I'm doing it. So he doesn't read it as I'm writing it. But what I love about him is the first day, and, and he doesn't read until it's published even. He oh, wow. Okay. But the first day it comes out, he'll buy the paperback, he'll buy the ebook, even though he doesn't have to. <laughs> but he does that for me, and I, I think that's really sweet. I love that. I love that. That's I like Bruce. I've never met Bruce, but now I like <laughs> Bruce tremendously. <laughs> <laughs> so what else is coming up for you this year? Well, um, the next... Well, I'm still like pretty heavy in the throes of perils of intimacy because it just came out. But um, I think the next thing I have coming out is called M for M. And it's a trilogy of three connected stories about one character, sort of a, uh, oh, what's the word? Somebody who's an underdog, an underdog in love. And it's three separate parts of his life where he's, finding love and then the second part is there's there's problems in the love he's found and the third part is a much more spiritual part i don't want to go into it all but but they all kind of re it's called m for m which is male for male which is a abbreviation online and all the stories revolve around online connections the first one is sort of a catfishing story the second one is a story um, told in blog form about a health crisis that causes a ripple in the relationship he's in and the third story incorporates social media into finding love so that comes out in june and then uh, dream spinner is re-releasing one of my uh, a short in September called I Heart Boston Terriers, which was originally published by Amber Quill, but uh, they went out of business and Dream Spinner took that and we've re-edited it and changed some of the, it's it's had a pretty extensive re-edit and I love it because it's, I have a Boston Terrier, so an I Heart Boston Terriers. And the Boston Terrier is the pivotal uh, thing that brings the two men together in the story so oh nice is it is it based on your boston terrier at all um well some of the expressions and the life i give to the boston terrier in the story whose name is mavis are based on my own boston terrier so yeah yeah and then i'm working on something that's kind of uh, a little different that's due pretty soon, um, and I'm just about done with it. It's a story called Sky Full of Mysteries. And it's an MM romance that incorporates <laughs> an alien abduction. Oh, okay, cool. Little sci-fi element in there. Yeah, but the, but the romance is really, really the big part of it. But the sci-fi element 
allows me to explore um, issues of what what happens when two people are separated for a long, long time, which is what happens in the story when the one character is abducted, when the two characters are in love and very young, and then he's returned to the earth many years later, still the same age, but the other guy is 40 something, and how they deal with that. Wow. So I'm intrigued now. Yeah, I, th- I, I think it's something kind of different than what we normally see in gay romance, but, and it it was a struggle. It's been a struggle to like decide how I was going to end it, but I've decided how I'm going to end it. And I just have like three more chapters to go and I think I'll be done with it, but I'm not going to say how I decided to end it. Well, no, that, you know, we don't want to give away spoilers. (laughs) We we try to be a spoiler free show. (laughs) (laughs) So what's the best way for folks to keep up with you online? keep track of everything you're doing. Well, I do have a website, rickrre.com, and that middle R is very important because there I always tell people there's another Rick Reed who's an author. He writes detective fiction. He's a former detective. Which I get odd emails sometimes that are meant for him from <laughs> crime victims that he worked on cases of, but That's neither here nor there. The important thing is it's rickrreed.com is my website. And then um, my blog, though, I think is the best place to really find out about my work. And that's rickrreedreality at blogspot.com. Okay. We will link to that in our show notes along with all the books that we've talked about. And I encourage people to go pick those up, especially the new one, the, The Perils of Intimacy. And I hope you write the pearls of intimacy one day just to kind of maybe give that title a whirl. <laughs> yeah. There's certainly pearls of intimacy. We've all seen them. <laughs> if <we're> lucky. <laughs> all right, Rick. Well, it's been awesome talking to you this morning. Thanks for hanging out with us for a little bit. In Somewhere on Mackinac by Jeff Adams, Jordan Monroe travels to Mackinac Island for the Somewhere in Time fan celebration weekend. Once there, he becomes attracted to local stable owner Miles Coulter. When Jordan learns the stable's in trouble, he wants to help despite Miles' resistance. As their relationship grows, he dreads the issues that face them. Can they forge a love as timeless as the romance in their favorite film? Find out in Somewhere on Mackinac by Jeff Adams. Available from DreamSpinnerPress.com, Amazon.com, and other ebook retailers. So I think that'll do it for this week's episode. Next week, in episode 86, the women who make up the writing team of Ari McKay will be here. They'll talk about their latest dream spun desire, Breaking Bonds. Yeah, I'm really glad we both had the chance to talk to them mm-hmm. about uh, their co-writing and all the books that they've done in the past. Uh, they I have a really long career. It's amazing. Yeah, they've written a whole lot of books. I especially enjoyed their dream spun, Striking Sparks from last year and their newest one is sort of continuing that series Mm -hmm. yeah so looking forward to that so until next time guys please remember keep reading and we'll talk at you later for detailed show notes and the complete episode backlist go to biggayfictionpodcast.com new episodes are available every Monday on all major podcast distributors and YouTube thanks for listening we'll see you next week 